Hello, and welcome to the Week 2 Supplemental Lecture on Leo Strauss's The Three Waves of Modernity. Strauss is a political philosopher, a political theorist, and in this work he's going to go through successive stages in the development of modern political theory, uh, and particularly look at the way these stages build toward a kind of a relativism, a kind of inability to ground values on which he thinks judgments involved in political philosophy requires. Um, Strauss is a figure who is often associated with the neoconservative movement. Some of his students or adherents become associated with that movement, and we'll take a look at neoconservatism later in the term. There are other people who contest the degree to which he had any major influence, um, but that's one of the reasons one would look at him as a figure. Here we're going to take a look at his attempt to talk about a crisis in modernity that he associates with a crisis in political philosophy, and along the way he'll bring up a number of themes that will come up uh, in various ways as we go through the course. So he talks about a crisis of modernity, and that crisis is associated with something that sounds like a kind of relativism, and relativism is a hot point. It'll come up again and again as we go through the term, this feeling that there's something about the institutionalization of modern science, the modern critique of religion, modernity as such, that has undermined our ability to make decisions about values. He says, modern Western man no longer knows what he wants. He no longer believes that he can know what is good and bad, what is right and wrong. And he says this is associated with a loss of faith in political philosophy, so that the idea of having a political philosophy now seems like a dream. Okay, he thinks political philosophy requires these kinds of judgments about right and wrong and good and bad, and something about the trajectory of modernity as undermining our comfort with making those decisions. And he says, well, how could this happen? How could we get into this state? And he said, well, there are two common views. He's not necessarily himself going to agree with either. He just presents them as views that are out there in the world. One view says scientific knowledge is the only valid knowledge. But scientific knowledge isn't the kind of knowledge that can validate value judgments. Okay, that's not what it does. It settles on facts, it can figure out the means to solve technical problems, but it does not decide the ends. And this difference between what's often called in later political and social theory instrumental reason, um, which is associated with science and with the application of science toward practical problems, versus some sort of substantive judgments that we might want to make to make our moral and value distinctions. Okay, so that's one idea about what's gone wrong with political philosophy. He says there's another view that's associated with people who don't like the fact-value distinction. They don't think it is a viable distinction. Uh, they say that you cannot claim to understand something without making a value judgment, that the statement that something is true or false is a kind of value judgment. So this distinction between facts and values breaks down. But who think that values are historically contingent and political philosophy is asserting something that is not historically contingent that requires universal validity. So the rise of a belief in the contingency of human values is what's undermining political philosophy. Okay. He doesn't give a verdict on these. He just sits them out there and he says, regardless, the crisis of modernity needs to be understood as a crisis of political philosophy. He says this may sound weird. Uh, why would the crisis of modernity be associated with a crisis in a particular academic department, a specialized academic field? But he says that's not really how he thinks of political philosophy. Political philosophy is a broader thing in which a range of non-academic persons participate as well. So he doesn't think it is so strange to think that a crisis of a particular kind of philosophy should be associated with a general crisis of modernity. So he says, how do we define modernity? And again, he starts off with a definition he's going to disagree with. Uh, he says, modernity is often thought to be driven by a kind of secularized religious faith. And he says that's a faith in the ability to establish heaven on earth by purely human means. He says, this isn't a very good way to try to distinguish modernity. There's actually a long tradition of different attempts to do this, dating back at least to Plato. Something more specific, either a more specific understanding of the kind of secularization you have in mind, or preferably something that captures the way in which modernity isn't just a rejection of something, it's not just a rejection of faith, it was a positive project. 
can we come up with a definition of modernity that captures its positivity, what it was actually trying to achieve? And then he says, but can we say that it was only one project? He says, nothing is more distinctive of modernity than the immense variety and frequency of radical change within it. Mere chronology does not establish meaningful unity. So along with pretty much everyone else we're reading this week, all of the other reading selections say that modernity, although it sounds like a historical term, it sounds like a chronological term, really doesn't mean that. It means something else. And he's agreeing with that. It means something else. It's not just a historical period. But he is suggesting that maybe a series of different projects, or a project with significant radical transformations over its course, may be a way to understand what modernity is about. And he says this will give us a non-arbitrary criterion for distinguishing modernity in terms of a what he calls a radical modification of pre-modern political philosophy. And what he's going to say is that there are three waves in which this radical transformation takes place, each sort of picking up from but also kicking back on parts of the previous one, uh, leading us to an impasse in the present time. And he associates the first wave with Machiavelli. Uh, and he says that what he's going to find in Machiavelli is often associated with a later figure, Hobbes, and indeed he's going to talk about some of the elements in Machiavelli's thought being things that are reinforced in later intellectual and social movements. But he thinks Machiavelli is the first to articulate quite clearly what he regards as a radical rupture, a radical break, with what had been characteristic of pre-modern forms of political philosophy. And he wants to choose two significant statements that Machiavelli makes. One of them is Machiavelli's complaint that traditional political philosophy focuses on a vision of how people ought to live rather than looking at how they do live. So Machiavelli is going to try to move political philosophy from the realm of the ideal, from the realm of the state thought about abstractly uh, without attention to how people live, and is going to focus on how they actually do live and how you can form a state that organizes people and institutionalizes behaviors with people as they actually are. And the other thing that Machiavelli does for Strauss that's quite radical is Machiavelli argues that chance, that nature, can be controlled by force. And Strauss views this as a really radical departure from an earlier tradition that understood humans as relatively powerless and is therefore subject to the whims of the gods or the whims of nature, to things fundamentally beyond their control. Okay, so Strauss says that implicitly this rejects a particular concept of nature in which all living beings are understood as being oriented to one, towards some sort of ideal of perfection. And what that ideal of perfection would be would be specific to the kind of living entity that you're looking at. And all living beings are organized into some sort of organic whole in which humans have a very defined place. Humans have an endpoint of being directed toward being rational or social or political, but they possess very limited power and they're subject to chance. They have limited control over the outcomes of their activities. So virtue within this conception of nature lies in the limitation of one's desires, in moderation. Machiavelli is going to break with this, according to Strauss, and say that virtue isn't some ideal thing toward which we should try to make our state, our governments, our commonwealths, conform or at least tend toward, it's something that serves the commonwealth. Strauss uses the phrase, for Machiavelli, the political problem becomes a technical problem. Okay, so there is an attainable ideal that has to do with the organization of institutions to render human behavior more virtuous than it would be without those institutions, that does not require an ideal beginning, does not require ideal citizens, does not require widespread virtue in the citizens of the state, but requires proper institutional design. Okay, so you get a technical problem that potentially can be solved. It may be difficult, but it's no longer in the realm of an ideal that floats outside of human practice. And associated with this view, Strauss says, is the idea that there is a distinction between nature and the human world, 
and that that distinction is one between nature and artifice. This distinction between nature and artifice is something we're going to talk about again next week. It's quite important in a number of different modern political and social theories, um, the notion that there's something particularly artificial about human institutions, while the natural world, as we move into the modern period, becomes understood as something that is spontaneously self-regulating through the interactions of material objects that don't intrinsically have anything to do with humans, and that's also quite distinctive. Okay, so pieces of that getting into Machiavelli's thought here. So Strauss says there's a series of compatible historical shifts that are consonant, that, that go along with what Machiavelli is thinking, even if they don't necessarily happen at exactly the same historical moment that he's writing. He talks about the emergence of natural science and its characteristics, and he characterizes it as something that rejects the concept of chance, so it's deterministic in its orientation. It shifts the notion of knowledge and what knowledge means, Strauss says, so that knowledge is no longer receptive, but something that is active and creative and done at human initiative. And you can think about how this corresponds to the Bacon and the Descartes, some of the other things that we looked at in the common lecture this week. Strauss says that modern natural science starts with a notion of truth and meaning originating with humanity and not inherent in an independent material world. And I talk about this point a little more in the lecture on the Bruno Latour reading. So if you want to take a look at that, I flesh out this concept. But there is this distinction that where both halves of the distinction are, are quite specifically modern, where the material world is understood as independent from humans, uh, as intrinsically devoid of meaning. Humans may project meaning onto it, but humans are the makers of meaning. Human history is the maker of meaning. And the conquest of nature becomes a goal, where nature is understood as intrinsically chaotic, and order and rationality are coming from human activity, from human labor. Nature is understood as material, as a sort of a dead object there that human labor can transform into something purposive. And political society is understood as artificial, as arising from social conventions, in contrast to nature, which is governed by its own spontaneously arising natural laws. And this is a distinction that will become quite important within classical liberalism generally, and we'll talk about this a bit next week. The idea that conscious political action is artificial, but spontaneously arising systems are natural. And obviously the quintessential spontaneously arising system is meant to be material nature, but this also flows through to the market, which is understood as a spontaneously self-regulating material world in which material objects are exchanged. Uh, if you stay out of its way, it will spontaneously self-organize. And so the market, strangely, can also figure as natural in certain branches of classical liberal thought. We'll talk about that next week. And then he talks about Hobbes, so the emergence of modern natural science and then Hobbes's reinterpretation of natural law. And Strauss says that one of the things that's most distinctive about Hobbes is that in earlier and pre-modern political theory, self-preservation ranks lowest in a hierarchy of human purposes. So of all the things that can drive humans, self-preservation is the most base. And so Strauss views it as sort of a shocking, a startling historical change that Hobbes is able to reinterpret natural law primarily in terms of the right of self-preservation. Uh, and Strauss says in a comment that he doesn't develop but that sort of has interesting implications for what he thinks politically, eventually we arrive at the view that universal affluence and peace is the necessary and sufficient condition of perfect justice. It's phrased as though he's not entirely happy with that result. We'll talk about this sort of conception of what justice is uh, several weeks from now when we talk about roles and debates over roles as conception of justice. So Machiavelli is the first wave. He pins the second wave on the work of Rousseau, and we'll take a look at some of Rousseau's work next week. Strauss says that Rousseau radicalizes the concept of a state of nature in which humans existed prior to entering into a social contract. The concept of a social contract we'll talk about a bit more next week, and I've talked about it in a number of the supplemental lectures this week. 
you have a problem of legitimacy. How do you understand the legitimacy of governments in a, in a period in which things like monarchies and aristocracies can no longer be taken totally for granted? They're no longer doxic. They're no longer things that, that seem natural. Because there's a lot of exposure in this historical period to other cultures, to other ways of organizing political life, to other religions and other cultural systems and other beliefs. And it raises questions of legitimacy. How do we know that the government that we have has the right, is, is, is the correct form of government, that it has the authority or the legitimacy to do what it wants? And social contract theory is one of the ways that emerges to try to answer this question. And it posits that there is either what's understood to be a real historical period, or often just a counterfactual kind of thought experiment. This purported period in which you had humans who were not in social relations with each other, who don't exist in some form of organized political community, they're in a state of nature. And in this counterfactual, or in this dawn of time history, these people are understood to have consented to a social contract because the state of nature was more difficult for them than coming into political society. And so they voluntarily sacrificed some of the freedom they had in the state of nature in order to join into a political relationship. And by doing that, they bind all of their heirs. And I talked about this view a little bit in relation to Kant, okay, and also in some of the other supplemental lectures. So for Strauss, Rousseau is going to engage with this social contract discussion but he's going to radicalize how the state of nature is understood. So for Rousseau, according to Strauss, the person who is outside society in the state of nature doesn't just lack political relationships with other people, they lack their basic humanity and rationality. They're a blank slate. Strauss says they have almost unlimited perfectibility and malleability. Okay, so they're kind of not really human yet. Rationality is acquired through an accidental historical process. So the process by which we enter into interactions with other people and things change over time teaches us something about what we can be as humans and is the way that we develop the forms of rational rationality that we currently possess. So civil society, entering into a contract with other people, entering into governmental relations, is required for self-preservation at a particular point for Rousseau but it needs to have a particular structure to make sure that within society you get a freedom that is at least approximating what you possess in the state of nature. And so you assess political institutions by whether they enable that kind of freedom. And the source of law that enables that is subject to something called the general will. And Strauss is very interested in this concept of the general will. There is a notion that all members of society contribute to the formation of the general will, but it is not the particular will of any individual member. It does not follow any particular interests. Uh, it somehow aggregates the interest of everyone, and then everyone is subject to it. And they're subject to it in such a way that no appeal to any natural law, any notion of human nature, any kind of outside ideal, can be used to appeal to against general will. And Strauss thinks this is new. Strauss thinks the first wave of modernization re retains a notion of natural law and human nature that sits above human institutions, and that the concept of general will does away with it, and therefore does away with a kind of a remnant ideal that, uh, that floated above the reality of how institutions are. So how do we know the general will is a good thing? How do we know it's a rational thing? Strauss says this comes down to its form. So rationality arises from the form of universality. And Strauss says the mere form of rationality, i.e. universality, vouches for the goodness of the content. And this is something that he'll trace through Kant, it's something that we'll talk about in relation to roles later in the term. This idea of whether it is sufficient to think about rationality or justice or any of these other categories by just thinking about universality. Within this kind of framework, what's known as human nature is reduced to human history. So what we think we are, what we think our nature is, is just what we have been, what we've shown ourselves to be over time. 
that doesn't tell us what we could be in the future. The future remains open-ended, so we don't really know what human nature is. We only know what human nature has been. Okay, so history is an open-ended process that hasn't told us, or hasn't necessarily told us, everything there is to know. So for Rousseau, social institutions that are grounded in the general will can make those institutions legitimate. But Strauss says this really isn't freedom. It's not the same kind of freedom that existed in the state of nature. It's just an acceptable compromise, given that at a certain point, entering into political association gives some advantages over being in the state of nature. You sacrifice some of your freedom. You indicate that political institutions can be legitimate if that freedom is sacrificed in particular ways, but you don't really possess the same level or type or quality of freedom that you did in the state of nature. So true freedom, Strauss says, is still found only in nature for Rousseau. So there's this sort of nostalgic idealization of things that might have been lost, things that are in nature that might have been lost in coming into political society. And in terms of the common lecture this week, this sort of wistful sense of what had been lost is often projected out onto the colonial other, onto visions of what non-European societies are like. They're perceived as more natural, less artificial, because their institutions aren't similar to the European institutions and are therefore perceived as not being institutions at all. And then you have the third wave. Strauss says that there is a strain of romanticism that is uniquely modern. It is not, in fact, an older form of thought. It is as modern as a notion of modernity. And you can see this romanticism in Rousseau and in his engagement and his wistfulness around the state of nature. But that romanticism develops in a different, what Strauss calls a Faustian direction, where Faust is the Goethe story that has to do with uh, the pact with the devil. And Strauss says, while well, Rousseau's goodness goes together with abstention from action, okay, so you can, you can be good in Rousseau's sense by not doing things. Rousseau's goodness goes together with abstention from action, with a kind of rest. Faust's goodness is unrest, infinite striving, dissatisfaction with everything finite, finished, complete, classic. The third wave develops a new understanding of the sentiment of existence, the experience of terror and anguish rather than of harmony and peace, of historic existence as necessarily tragic. There's no escape from the human to nature. There's no possibility of genuine happiness, or the highest of which man is capable has nothing to do with happiness. And again, we looked at a couple of excerpts from Nietzsche when we were looking at our text in the common lecture this week, you can feel in those excerpts what Strauss has in mind here. So this idea that something has been lost, that there is something tragic, that it is momentous in its tragicness, but that it's not something that we can get back behind or overcome. There's no innocent place that we can go back to or wish for that, uh, that might not have had this characteristic, this tragic characteristic. And Strauss says Nietzsche is the first one to confront History as non-rational and meaningless, so history as it is presented in this sort of secularized scientific conception, and to explore the implications of a non-rational, meaningless history for ideals of historical progress and rationality. And the implication for these ideals is that the ideals have no basis. So if you think that history is non-rational and meaningless, Strauss is saying, you can't have an ideal of historical progress or ideal of rationality. Nietzsche is the one who explores that and confronts it. So there's no necessary culmination of history. History is not itself driving toward anything, which means that the outcome of historical processes is going to come down to human will to how we assert our will on history. And then Strauss summarizes how Nietzsche thinks that will play out. Surely the nature of man is will to power, and this means on the primary level the will to overpower others. Man does not by nature will equality. Man derives enjoyment from overpowering others as well as himself. Whereas Rousseau's natural man is compassionate, Nietzsche's natural man 
looks cool. So what are the political implications? And this is where Strauss ends the piece. He says, I draw a political conclusion from the foregoing remarks. The theory of liberal democracy, as well as of communism, originated in the first and second waves of modernity. So liberal democracy and communism for Strauss are two forms of political theory that are still, they still have an optimism in history. They still have a notion of historical rationality of history trending toward better things and trending toward a more rational society. They just have different visions of what that society is going to be. The political implication of the third wave, which is the more relativist way, the true embrace of the meaninglessness of history, proved to be fascism. Yet this undeniable fact, okay, the fact that the third wave culminates historically in fascism, does not permit us to return to earlier forms of modern thought. Okay, so Strauss is saying you can't look at where that particular line of romanticism led and say, that's fine, we'll just go back to the first and second wave. Strauss is saying that's not acceptable. The critique of modern rationalism or the modern belief in reason by Nietzsche cannot be dismissed or forgotten. This is the deepest reason for the crisis of liberal democracy. Okay, and Strauss is by no means the only person who thinks there is a crisis of liberal democracy. We'll read debates about this as we move into the political systems section of the course. The theoretical crisis does not necessarily lead to a practical crisis, for the superiority of liberal democracy to communism, Stalinist or post-Stalinist, is obvious enough. And above all, liberal democracy, in contradistinction to communism and fascism, derive powerful support from a way of thinking which cannot be called modern at all, the pre-modern thought of our Western tradition. It's an interesting line to end it on. He has barred the idea that we might go back to earlier forms of modern thought, okay? because he says Nietzsche's critique does away with that. You cannot go back the, there after his critique of that particular kind of rationalism. But this sort of suggests that it doesn't bar going back to something even earlier, going back to something pre-modern uh, that is still somehow a live tradition that is activated in liberal democracy but that is not available to communism and fascism. We'll see how that develops.